keeps dropping your way around a cocktail party to see which conversation will prove the most interesting. Basically, I eat as much meat as I like, but no pasta, no cheese. We'll now take a short break from our lesson to show you some commercials. These are sponsored messages paid for by manufacturers in an attempt to cajole the audience into making knee-jerk purchasing decisions. And they differ from standard programs in that while standard programs are made by cretins, commercials are made by absolute cretins. Bear that in mind during the following sequence. When choosing what to watch, you should also pay careful attention to any extraneous words used in a program's title, as these provide valuable clues to its content. For instance, the word extra often indicates a cheaper cut-down spin-off version of a popular program, produced specifically to drive terrestrial viewers to a station's less popular digital offshoot. Since such productions often have a budget of 15 pence and are essentially the unloved gingerhead runt sibling to the main broadcast, watching them can be rubbish. So, when you see the word extra, mentally replace it with the words cast-offs, leftovers or scrag ends for a clearer idea of what to expect. The word uncut is slightly different. This indicates a more extreme version of a programme originally broadcast in an earlier time slot. For example, if the 9.30 showing of a programme called Twit Club contains twits exhibiting slightly raucous behaviour, the 11.30 Twit Club Uncut will feature twits who are completely out of control! But whatever type of twit you prefer, the likelihood is that at some point you'll find yourself watching something disappointing, during which time the compulsion to channel surf can be hard to resist. But you can stave off the urge to flip by exercising and increasing your boredom threshold. The following sequence will help you gauge your own boredom threshold. It lasts just 60 seconds, but will feel far, far longer. All you have to do is count the number of times you find yourself fighting the urge to change channels. The sequence starts now. average viewer has to resist the urge to switch channels 48 times during that sequence. Your boredom threshold is considerably lower, which is why you're still here, isn't it, dum dum? Many modern programs aren't content to simply lie back and be stared at, so they encourage the viewer to interact with the broadcast itself. For example, this phone-in quiz from daytime show This Morning poses a question and invites viewers to call a premium rate number with the solution. But the most difficult question to answer about this quiz is, why bother with the quiz at all? Since the answer is so obvious, only a backward farmhand who'd spent the morning smacking himself on the head with a spade could possibly get it wrong. The answer is C. So why did they bother with the quiz? Was it A? to flatter the audience into thinking themselves clever, B, to ensure more people phone in, 
or C, because TV producers are obliged to make such contests into a game of skill rather than a straightforward lottery, which is why they cover their asses by providing an insultingly simple question, while simultaneously ensuring as many people as possible will call their expensive phone line, thereby insulting the viewer's intelligence twice at the same time! The correct answer, of course, is C. Which leads us to another question, namely, the average programme maker believes the audience is A. Intelligent B. Demanding or C. A dumb mass of exploitable proletarian flesh bags with little or no mind of its own. If you think you know, call 090 987 90981. We'll tell you the answer in a moment, so get dialing. In the meantime, back to interactivity. From now on, you are entirely in control. Reality TV shows often feature a phone in eviction vote, where the audience decides which preening dumbbell they can withstand the longest. Weirdly, such votes often result in a frightening display of eugenic conformity, as any contestant exhibiting a glimmer of individuality is quickly ejected, leaving behind a bland wash of automatons from which the winner will eventually be drawn. This sometimes leaves the producers struggling to make the programme seem interesting and explains at a stroke why the answer to our earlier question was C. There are other, more sophisticated examples of interactivity which you should accustom yourself with at the earliest opportunity. For example, this is the Friendly TV channel, which encourages viewers to interact with its on-screen presenters, or friends, via text message, or by telephone. Let's see. Hello, Friendly TV. Hi, who's this? Sorry? George, how are you and where are you from, George? London, wonderful. What are you up to today? Nothing. OK, George, thanks for ringing and speak to you soon. Bye. Yeah? Oh, he's gone. I just spoke to George, who's actually from London. As you can see, the greater the level of interactivity, the greater the level of involvement engendered in the viewer. But extreme involvement can be dangerous. Quiz loss hubby's suicide. A husband killed himself after his wife beat him in the Testination TV quiz show, An Inquest Heard. When she scored a higher mark as they watched the BBC General Knowledge Show, he threw his notepad and pen across the room and called himself Thick. After his wife went to bed at their home, he took about 40 pills and drank a bottle of vodka. However, such tragedies are rare. Most programmes try to make you feel good about yourself. And this, coupled with infinite distraction, makes it easy for viewers at home to use television to block out the reality of their lives. Used carefully, television can induce a trance-like state in the viewer, which has many beneficial uses. For example, this couple fell out of love four years ago, but have learned that using television as a substitute for personal interaction dramatically reduces the level of mutual loathing between them. Thus, television has kept their relationship alive well beyond its natural duration, and with any luck will continue to do so until the end of their lives together. Thanks to her use of television, this woman is unaware of her own lack of life experience. By watching people on television converse, laugh, attend parties and fire pistols, she shares some of their enjoyment and consequently has little desire to take part in mundane human activities such as attracting a mate or scaling the career ladder. Instead, she has created a secure mental bubble for herself which is unlikely to ever be breached by outside contact. Here we see a man amusing himself and a friend by making sarcastic comments about a TV show. Such behaviour keeps both entertained and reinforces their shared sense of superiority. Cynical or sardonic viewers often believe that they have a firmer grasp on reality than the masses watching the same broadcast unironically, who, they reason, must be in some way insane to put up with such garbage. Yet this is not the case. Serial killer Dennis Nielsen used to watch television in the company of his victims' corpses, muttering sarcastic comments on soaps and sitcoms as he cuddled their lifeless bodies. In other words, one's capacity to mock an episode of Bargain Hunt should not be taken as a reliable indicator of mental health. 
and indeed may mark its protagonist out as an angry outsider harboring deep resentment for society. Here we see another outsider harboring resentment in front of his television. He believes his anger is caused by the low quality of the programme he's watching, but in reality it's fueled by his own underachievement. In his youth he dreamt of being a great playwright, but things